This episode of the Linux Action Show is brought to you by the good-looking folks at GoDaddy.com. Use our code Linux and save yourself some cash. This week on the Linux Action Show... Is Fedora the crazy dancing hippie of Linux distributions? Or not? Tune in to find out! Plus, our thoughts on Linux Mint 13 and how to stash your home folder on its own partition. And so much more! Oh! This week! The Linux Action Show! Welcome to season 22 of the Linux Action Show. My name is Brian. That guy next to me, that beautiful hunk of man, is Chris. Whoa, you're so loud this morning, B-Man. Jeez, you gotta be careful. I'm a little hungover today. I'm a, I'm a little hungover. <laughs> Feeling a little rough? Yeah, it's a little rough today. But it's check this out. Even in my phased state, I can still tell you this is awesome. This new Cadillac XTS runs Linux. Yeah. This was all over our subreddit this week. This was submitted several times. People are pretty impressed by this. Uh, I, I dug through this uh, Wired article, which you can find a link to in the show notes if you want to check this out. So what, what is running Linux is Linux is the Cadillac user experience, so their, their Dash system and things like that. The Q. It's got an ARM 11 processor, and it powers two displays, one 8-inch capacitive uh, touchscreen. This is the yep. first non-resistive screen in a car. Uh, and also a second 12.3-inch fully configurable instrument cluster. Um, yeah. So they like this the speedometer and the uh, tachometer, all those right. kinds of things are totally, uh, totally a user adjustable. And the That's nav awesome. system runs Linux. Yeah, man, this is really cool. It's also I got would USB theme ports. The hell out of that. It's got USB ports. You bring in MP3s to this thing. It's got apps. This one's so great. If you like, come up with a nice L cars theme for your dash. Mm. I would buy that car just to put an L cars theme on my. That dash. would be awesome. I like that it comes with Pandora too, because you know I listen to Pandora when I'm listening to music more than I listen to radio any day of the week. Uh, but uh, pretty slick looking. So new. Uh, there you go. So there's the there's the uh, different customization options. Some of the different customization options for the dash. This one's pretty high tech looking. Kind of, kind of neat. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that. Wow, B- I man, love the hell out of that. We got a big show, so we're doing we're doing the Fedora Seventeen review this week. Yes, we are. And uh, Matt's gonna stop by in his how to and show us how to take your slash home and put it on its own partition. Set it up so that way you can reload your machine for different distros and you don't have to worry about your home dry, home partition getting blown up. I always do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Always got to have home on a different partition. Preferably really a nice. different drive right. if I can. I used to get really serious about it and do a whole bunch of different partitions. Um, really? I don't know I don't know what Matt's approach is going to be because I haven't seen it yet, but uh, these days I'm more of, yeah, put home on its own, do a root and do a swap. And I usually call it good because I, re- I reload I often enough that, that that tends to be See, it. See, I don't even usually do a swap anymore. Wow, whoa, you are hardcore. What do you need swap for? Wow. RAM costs like, th- it's like three gigs for a penny right well, now. Well, because, you know, the swap files use for other just, you know, OS maintenance things, like just moving things out of memory and things like that, you know. You, know. you don't need it. Maybe I want to do like a memory dump and I don't System's I don't. faster without swap. Yeah, maybe I'm getting old, man. Getting old. I mean, if you would only have a couple of gigs, it's fine. But once you get like eight gigs or so, yeah. at that point, you're like, well, what the hell you need swap for? You might be right. Maybe it's, That's my thought. Maybe I'm just being an old codger. You're man. an old stick in the mud, Chris. So, uh, fantastic Android app pick for you this week. Also, a great Linux app pick. And yep. we got a few other things. But first... It's time to say good morning to GoDaddy.com and the beautiful Danica Patrick, Chris Patrick. You gotta stop doing that. <laughs> you gotta stop. You gotta stop getting in front of Danica I, like that. It's not cool. It's not cool. There we go. Hi, do I, do I look hi, like I'm Danica. Join twin when I do this? No, oh. no, no. You look like you're rubbing up against yeah. Danica all week. Well, you okay. look like look like you're taking your fuzzy head and you're rubbing it against Wait, her ear, see, see. which is something that I want to do, but I'm annoyed that you're doing it. Yeah, look at this. this is nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like give it, giving her chin a scratch there. <laughs> yeah. So what we're saying is, you should go to GoDaddy.com, yeah. put, put some things in. Now we had a great deal last week, B man. We had a really great deal, but that is expired. However, if you are actually a first time GoDaddy customer, if you use the code twenty five May eight, you'll save twenty five percent off. Twenty five percent off if you use the code twenty five May eight. If you are already an existing GoDaddy customer, use our code Linux. Save 10%. 10%. Plus, it's like you're voting for Linux. Yeah. 
You're is, voting for Linux, which is kind of awesome. You want to put you want to put your 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 money where your mouth is and vote for Linux. Yep, yep, I say so. So uh, <laughs> thank you to GoDaddy for uh, supporting this week's episode of the Linux Action Show, and thank you everybody who uses our codes twenty five May eight and Linux. Fancy. All right, B man. Let's talk about my Android app pick this week. Yes, I thought please. of you. I need to hear about this. I thought of you when I picked this one. It's important. It's a free app, and it's called Poop Salary. Yeah. Let's just let that one just simmer for a second. All right. So uh, you might have, uh, by the by the name, surmised that this is a tool which aims to help you time and track the amount of money you spend if you use your rough hourly wage, and you track it while you're pooping. So you can go in here and say, I did this, that, that, but you know, put it all in there. And you can track to see if you're losing money or if you're, you know, you get some historical stats on, on, uh, on your pooping. I'm going to say this straight up. I don't know if you guys are seeing the screenshot, but that guy does not poop much. Like, like that's like no poop at all. That's like speed pooping. Like, man, I tell you, I take, I take time. When I sit down on the pod, I take time, you know? So I think And you, seriously, he spent like 12 minutes on it, and it, it, that cost him a grand total of like 17 cents or something like that. One, this guy gets a terrible hourly wage. Yeah. Like less than minimum wage yeah. here. I mean, no. significantly less. Like, yeah. like less than a dollar an hour. And two, he needs to take more time pooping. It's good for your health. So there you go. Check it out. Uh, thank you to uh, Toaster J in the uh, Reddit who submitted this last week. Uh, I just thought, you know, and I, what I like too is that it's free, but it does have ads, and the ad shot that he used is it's got uh, William Shatner. <laughs> it's the negotiator. Yeah. That's pretty fantastic. That's pretty, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, I would take that snapshot I would use too. Oh, yeah. All right, B-Man, should we do the app pick? I think we should. Lay it on me. The app pick this week is Miro. Now, Miro, we've talked about plenty in the past, but it hasn't been an official app pick, and it's been a while since we've talked about it. Miro is just a really fantastic video aggregator. So if you've got a bunch of video podcasts that you watch, I guess it technically can do audio too, but yeah. really it's for video yeah. uh, that you watch, you can grab it in Miro. It has a really nice UI. It runs on every platform on the world, which is kind of handy if you're jumping around between uh, you know, your work machine and your home machine and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's just really cool. Supports torrents too, which is nice. Yeah. So you can subscribe to the Linux Action Show torrent feed and it'll download those for you it's automatically. Handy, isn't it? Uh, and thanks to uh, a helpful user in Reddit, they uh, submitted a few of the Linux Action Show feeds to the Miro Guide again, because we had the Jupiter Master Jupiter Broadcasting feed in there. Right. Uh, so then that inspired me to also, I submitted TechSnap and Cybite and Unfilter, and I'm going to submit a few more shows. So we, nice. Yeah. Nice. So, so you can check, find that all in Miro. There you go. So check it out. Miro, which has honestly gotten better and better and better. When, when, when it first became Miro, after it was Democracy Player, uh, yeah. I felt like it was kind of a bit of a resource pig. But now with Miro 5, it, it, it feels really, pretty good. Yeah, they really tightened it up. I like it too. All right, B-Man, should we do our totally random, not oh, pre-picked yeah. at all distro pick? Oh, Here yeah. Pretty loud. Boom. Boom, right there. Tie Bride. What? Now, for there's a couple of things I need to say about this distro. Oh. One is that it's spelled awesome. It's got all sorts of Ys in it. Hi Bride. Can't argue with there. Now, here's the cool part about it. The, Hybrid is your run-of-the-mill distro. What it's based on doesn't matter. Oh. What apps it comes with doesn't matter. Oh. What matters is this. Okay. It's got this thing called the high menu. And the high menu actually allows you to, without logging out, without closing any applications, switch between desktop environments. So if you want to check out the difference between, you know, say, uh, you know, Gnome Shell huh. and KDE or a whole mess of other ones. I mean, a whole mess of them. Well, that's a neat trick. You just use this high menu, this little pop up high menu, and bam, you switch right between them. That is. It's got trick. enlightenment and everything. So if you want to just like take this desktop environments for a spin, there is nothing quite like Hybrid. Huh. huh. Uh, well, and especially like if they're up to date too, which I noticed. Uh, it's in uh, French. Yeah, look at this. We got F. But I noticed GNOME <laughs> 3. FWM, OpenBox, LXDE, XFCE, Unity, GNOME 3, KDE. I mean, it's got the full open box goodness. I mean, yeah. it's it's awesome. Yeah, it's really it's cool. It's ready to rock and roll. How would you say? Hybrid? Hybrid, I guess. Yeah. Hybrid. Yeah. Hybrid. It's off, it, it, hybrid makes sense. That's an awfully ambitious. Uh, Crazy, awfully ambitious, isn't it? Yeah. I like yeah. That. I mean, here's the thing. It's not the kind of distro you're going to use as your main day-to-day -day distro, I don't think. But way cool for checking out desktop environments. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I wanted to give a mention. Is it? How do you suppose you say that? Sakura, Sakrambu? 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 You got me, dude. Uh, cool dude in the IRC and in the community. He made a uh, pick search tool. He's just kind of playing around, so he wanted some feedback. 
So I got to link this in the show notes. If we made a previous pick, you can go in here and you can, you know, so you can, I wonder if I ever did a fart app pick. So we'll do a search for that. Nope, no fart app pick. So that kind of thing. So you can kind of see, you know, what kind of different, uh, there you go. So there's a couple different network. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, and there's the tricorder app pick too. So that's a neat way to, and he had did the same thing for the distros and the app picks. Way cool. So a uh, link to that in the show notes is kind of a long URL. So just go grab that in the show notes. Glorious. All right, B-Man, let's do the news. New in the news this week. All right, B-Man, the top story on the news docket for this week. Linux 3.4 has been released. Woohoo! This is exciting. So a new kernel with many new features, as the Phronix article puts many it. Many new features. Uh, big big uh, Intel improvements for Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge processors. There's a new hotness out there, which is awesome. Uh, new power management for a PCIe uh, uh, stuff. And also, B-Man, the one I like the most, mm-hmm. mini ButterFS changes. Because there's been some there's been some things with ButterFS that I just keep waiting on. I keep waiting yeah. on. But what I find kind of funny about this is the, the the ButterFS changes that have gone in here, and also honestly, the X32 ABI support is also kind of big. I would I would love to have seen that land in the just the last round of distros we're seeing. Just the absolute. I, I wonder if OpenSUSE will ship with three four since they're a little bit further out. I don't know. It's it a big would be change, nice, wouldn't it? And it bet, is a I've, big last minute yeah. change, though. But uh, with the with the improvements for the latest processors, for somebody who's building a uh, a modern system like today and getting you know one of those chips, yeah, uh, <clears throat> it's a good day to be an Arch user or a Gen two user because you know this is going to be hitting their systems a lot sooner than everybody who's on the on the distro like cycle. Thirty seven seconds after it comes out, yeah, yeah. That's one. That's one of the things that God, I love Arch. Back in the day. When the kernel was adding things that like I really needed, like stuff for Samba servers, they made Samba yeah. servers more stable or whatever it was. Yeah, uh, that was one of the things that drove me to Gen two. Was I? I just I just needed that frequency. It. It's like yeah. wait a minute. So if I'm using if I'm using this distribution, I have to wait six months. But if I'm using this distribution, I can use it tomorrow. And yeah, it's a little it's a little newer. It's a little riskier. But that 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 but flexibility. If you need it. Yeah, that flexibility was so nice. I love Arch. So, anyways, uh, check it out. They're uh, they're releasing the kernel and they'll probably hitting the distro near you soon. All right, B man. Next story on the news docket: Linux Mint 13 Maya has been released. And the big news with this one is it comes in two main flavors: the Mate Edition and the Cinnamon Edition. And uh, of course, both those desktops are pretty cutting edge in terms of code. So I think Mint's really sticking their neck out here. Of course, they've got other editions really too. Really sticking their neck out there. I think I think they are. Uh, it's I, crazy. What do you th- now? Okay, do you think we should review Linux Mint on the show? B- bear in mind that we've been doing a lot of reviews recently. We've we've been doing a lot of reviews, and I was trying to think about that. I mean, we did kind of a review of Cinnamon, and honestly, that's all there is to review in Linux, Linux Mint 13, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, like yeah. like it's just going to become a well, let's review Cinnamon again sort do you of think? thing, and it hasn't changed that much. Do you think? And we could go and we could review Mate, but why on earth would we review Mate? Like I don't I don't mean that in the negative way cuz Mate's fine. I mean, it's it's a, it's a fine project, but I don't I don't know what we'd talk about. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm wondering. Unless, uh, unless there was something, yeah, unless there was something new to try and mate. Uh, here, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna, I'm, I'm creating a poll while you chat about it, and I'll, we'll poll the chat room. So uh, we'll look, we'll come back at that towards the end of the news uh, docket. Yeah, if you guys want to see it, I mean, I'll review it. I just don't know. So there we go. I started a vote. I started a poll. And what I love about Go Poll Go too is you can see people voting all around the world, which is really neat. That is pretty. You cool. get to see it in real time. Yeah. So we, we've already had uh, three votes for Nope. So uh, we'll keep. Oh, it's coming back. Yes. Oh, no. Nope's <laughs> pulling ahead. Oh, nope. Oh, it's actually this go pull go thing is awesome. I know. I love right? watching it. And look, shift like look, that. we can see people. So let's see how many votes did we have in France? We had one person vote in, in, in the, the uh, south of France. In the south of France. Yeah. I can't even say that. My I know. my two years but of you s- high school French is not helping me out here. Look at this. See, we got. Oh man, incredible people are voting in Greece right now. Uh, people are voting, uh, geez, wow, Sweden? Look at that. This is awesome. Awesome. So, and of course, the United States and Canada and all of that as well. So, uh, all right, well, we'll let the chat room keep voting, but right now, 64% are saying, nope, don't review Linux Mint 13. Yeah, I mean, it's fine. I mean, uh, you know, kudos to the, the Linux Mint team for getting another release out. I'm sure it's a quality release. I mean, the last one was, was, was pretty solid. Linux Mint 12 was good. Uh, but I don't really know what to look at at this one. Yeah. So and and you know they're obviously going off on a branch here that's 
Ubuntu is trying to distinguish themselves with Unity. They're going to try to distinguish themselves with Cinnamon. Yeah. And I think there is some there's some logic there to be because you'll be a standout. And Mint is always kind of suffered from that. Oh well, it's just an Ubuntu. It's, it's just Ubuntu an, with Codex. Yeah. And and then if they if they're able to differentiate themselves with a with a solid desktop, then and honestly, yeah. Cinnamon, I know you have issues with the way it was created and how it was, and how it is now kind of a fork of GNOME three and the fact <clears> that it <throat> crashes every five minutes. I think once it starts to stabilize, it. I mean, it's a pretty slick desktop. It really is slick. That's that's true. The seventeen other really slick desktops that I can choose between. I, I want to choose Cinnamon because it's so much like three or four of the other ones that already exist. Well, that's a really good point. We'll you see made. about that. That's Peter. a good point. We'll see. Uh, Chris makes a good point hey. about the similarity to projects that already exist. You so therefore, use it. You say, that now. Use you it, say you know? that now, but maybe Cinnamon's gonna get real bad. I'm just saying you make good points, Chris. All right, you make excellent points. Let's go to the next story before we go back and check on our polls, should we? Uh, no cost desktop software development is dead on Windows 8, says Ars Technica. Well, that. That, not I thought you said. Hey, let me set it up. Let me set it up, and then you can you can talk about it. So uh, here, here you go. Uh, Visual Studio 11 Express. That's the free version of Visual Studio. The free to use version uh, can produce nothing else except for. Metro apps. Right. If you stick with uh, C plus plus two thousand ten uh, or Visual, you know, uh, Visual what? What are they? Dot net. What is, what's the hash? Visual C sharp. C sharp. Visual C sharp. Yeah. Two thousand ten Express products. Uh, or you can buy the new Visual Studio eleven professional. Um, right. Express tools will produce only two things: Metro style applications for Windows eight and websites. Yeah. Well, that's what Microsoft's pushing. That just seems ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous too. So, the t- so, for, so what they're saying is, if you want to use, and I guess the, I guess the new Visual Studio has a bunch of compiler improvements, much more standards compliant. Uh, anyways, if you, if you, if you forfeit all that and stick with an older version, you're all right. You can write traditional desktop apps. But if you want to write a desktop app for Windows 8, you gotta, your entry point now is four hundred dollars. Well, like it used to be. So how? It's so the cheaper Express, than it. It's actually cheaper than the, it used the Express to be. thing had only been around for a little while. Yeah, the Express thing yeah. has only been around for a little while. And here's the thing. I mean, it's so Microsoft's trying to push their Metro and their their HTML e stuff. But really what this is is just basically Microsoft noticing that them coming out with the free version of all their tools made made them lose a bunch of money. <laughs> um so people weren't picking up yeah. as often the the paid version of their tools. Right. So they're they they figure like this is a win win. We can get a bunch of people to move over to Metro apps, which we need them to do. Yep. And we can also then make revenue because we know people are gonna still gonna want to make apps. Yeah. 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 I mean it's it's not that surprising. It's kind of almost unexpected. It's not really as big a news story as I think some people talk about I think you're because there's right. not the developers of the world were expecting this. especially the ones that make money off of it yeah they knew it was coming yeah i mean microsoft was very clear that this is what was coming yeah all right well i just thought that was interesting because it is a big um it's it, i think there's a lot of things that are lining up to potentially make linux be very attractive in the next coming years oh, yeah. and uh you know not going to a crazy metro style ui and you, you, you know Apple's going to integrate iOS and OS X at some point or just scrap OS X. Yep. And people are going to want to jump to Linux. And having a lot of options for free development is going to be... Is killer. Yeah. So yeah. that's, that's why I wanted... Killer. That's The chat room was asking, why are you talking about this? This isn't Linux news. But uh, it's funny because it came from somebody who kind of looks like Malicious is his nickname. Yeah. Now, it was kind of a malicious question. Uh, but that's <laughs> Kind why. of. That's why. Because I think in the big picture, it paints an interesting context. Speaking of things that are interesting, B-Man... Let's head over to the GoPoll Go and see what we got. All right, here we go. Uh, coming in at... They're saying uh, no. Yeah. 70% say it sounds boring to review Linux Mint 13. Yeah. This and, is what I'm thinking. And see, oh, I, we even got some reviews now down here in Brazil. Somebody voted down in Brazil in uh, Santa Carita or Canta, Cantina. Santa... Catarina? Whatever. I don't know. Awesome. Awesome, uh, so, yeah. Okay, I probably want to hang out there. There you go. There's the official. I think, we'll, I think we'll say, nope, we are not going to do a Mint 13 review unless we see a lot of comments to the contrary. Yeah. All right, B-Man, let's talk about OwnCloud 4.0. It just hit the web. And didn't 3 just come out? Yeah. Well, and 2 before that. These guys crank, man. They really do. So uh, I think one of the features that I'm the most excited about is two-way calendar sync. Remember, that was one of the That's things. That's nice, in, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, drag and drop upload from your desktop to the own cloud web interface. They're also starting to work with a lot of desktop clients. The nice virgin- versioning is going to help. Yep. I almost said virgining. Virgining. Yeah. Virgining <laughs> always helps. Virgining helps. Uh, so uh, they have a, they have also um, overall performance improvements, of course. But the linking up with the external apps so you can do desktop that's sync great. and great. calendar syncing. Jeez, that's huge. Built-in viewer for ODF files as well. Like so you upload that. an ODF. Uh, the categories for your calendar now. 
And uh, a also nice new public API. Shared calendars as well. So just if you want to do a nice little plug-in apps to it, nice this little API. Is coming, this is home cloud is becoming a very serious small little business app. It thing. really is, isn't it? Uh, dang. Yeah. Dang. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think we're going to be using that not in not, the not-too-distant future. Seriously. For it's it's pretty slick. All right, B-Man. The last story on the news docket. Fedora 17 goes gold. It's golden. You know what we should do? <laughs> we should review that. All right, B-Man. Let's jump in to the Fedora 17 review. About five years ago, was it five years ago that Fedora Core 6 came out? <laughs> About five years ago, we did a review on the Linux Action Show. Yeah. Maybe close to six years. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's getting, it, actually, yeah, it's closer to six years because we're coming up, uh, yeah, because we're, we're a full six years in now, Linux Action Show. And, uh, or at least we will be in a week or two. We did a review of Fedora Core 6. Yeah. Before they dropped the word core from their release. Right. And we loved it. Yeah. We, we, we just showered it with affection. We sprinkled confetti people, on it. People we, know this by now because we mentioned this. We, we, we put a tiara on top That's of its true. head. We hugged it and loved it. And it yeah. was really my primary distro for a while. This is the DNA theme. It was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful theme, a beautiful system. It ran well on every machine we threw on It was like on one of the clear. first or one of the best. It was like one of the early good iterations of the clear looks theme. Too. Yeah, it was just yeah. gorgeous. All right. Okay. And then, and then Fedora 7 came along and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13 and 14 and 15 and 16. And we hated every single one of them. Every <laughs> single one. And, I know, and to, be, to be fair, we harshed on them probably more than they even deserved because we liked Fedora Core 6 so much. We were so a little much. butthurt, is what you're saying? Yeah, we were a little hurt. We were, we were, we were a little sore and tender because we, we loved Fedora Core 6. We really enjoyed using it. And we felt like all the subsequent releases just kind of went off the rails. I had problems installing it half the time. I couldn't get it running. It was slow. The themes were looked like Windows 2000. It just was was terrible oh so uh, fedora 17 fedora 17's here just went gold you know that means i should i should put on my review hat put on too. your review hat. Okay, all right, all right, all right. so it's time to review fedora 17 now right. people have gotten used to uh me harshing on fedora what no usually in, in an extreme way hmm, doesn't sound like you at all be man so i'm gonna go just get this out of the way right now okay i absolutely unequivocally Loved Fedora 17. Oh, I thought good. it was fantastic. Wow. In fact, I'd say that this is the best release the Fedora team has ever had. Significantly better than, uh, than even Fedora Core 6. It looks gorgeous, runs fast, and I loved it. Chris? Well, all right. So let's talk about how it looks. Uh, here's how it looks if you're watching the video version. That's beautiful. It is a background. There's nothing. I mean, this is just gnome shell. Clean. There's clean it's stock gnome shell yeah, it is with stock a few minor shell. modifications yeah. a great background and some nice additions going on it just is great looking uh so let's go here to uh i don't know let's bring up nautilus oops not that one clicked on the wrong thing there b-man that's okay you wouldn't think so when the icons are 20 feet large uh but that you could do that manage. well this is why um, they're so big now let me just close this which is really easy to do on gnome shell because there is only a close button and no minimize right -click. But, or you know uh, so you just right click. Uh, hey, hey, am I gonna be the crankier or am I not? Huh? I don't know. Am I playing bad cop or am I not, Brian? I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Look at those icons, B man. <laughs> yeah, nice, isn't they? <laughs> you are so full of crap, dude. Are you joking? They those are cute. Those are the stock gnome icons. That they look good though. Why replace them? This is the whole thing that I've that I've gotten against Fedora for in the past. They they leave stuff stock when it's ugly, and when stuff looks really good, like they'll take the, in the past they've taken stock like gnome themes, yeah. and they've modified them seriously. I swear to God, to look as much like Windows 2000 as possible, and then they tell me it's gorgeous, and, and I have to say no. But in this case, they took stock when it looked gorgeous and they updated things when it needed updating. I, I mean, I'll go with you. You know, it is... But it, aren't those nice? It, are those no. not nice icons? No, they are not. You really don't like those? No. I think they're clean and pleasant and not gaudy. To me, those icons... I would say they are very gaudy. Those icons, to me, would look good 10 years from now. I think that those are timeless-looking icons. Are you shit... Are you asking they're, they're me right now? They're simple, embossed folders. I think they're clean-looking. I like them. They're clean, they're muted, and they're... Are you they're, asking they're, me? No, are I'm not joking? joking. I think they're fantastic-looking. Dude, 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 really? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, it dude, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I think they're they easy look great. To change. Yeah, they're easy to change. All right. So that is GNOME 3.4, and this is uh, it ships with Linux kernel 3.3. .3. Uh, 
It's got Haskell Platform 2011.4 <laughs> in it, B Man. It's also, uh, that by the way, the feature that you led with was the updated version of Haskell. It's also got support for 16 terabyte <laughs> XT4. Uh, so if you got 16 terabytes laying around, you can format that now. So you should XT4. be good to go. Yeah. 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 Just, just in time for nobody to use. Anyways. Uh, so let's see. Other desktop features are non-uniform memory management daemon, uh, virtualized sandbox support. Also, another great desktop feature supporting OpenStack's quantum virtual network service. Yep, that's a. I just I, I've been. I, I mean, I really have bothered me that Ubuntu hasn't had that. Uh, one thing I do have to say, all joking aside, is uh, this is the release where they started merging the directories. Yeah, this is this is the grand directory unification release. So uh, it means that directories like slash bin and slash lib and slash sbin have been moved into slash user slash bin, respectively. So they're you know those sbins yeah. down there. Yeah. Uh, so so basically, any anywhere that there was any sort of even theoretical redundancy where there's multiple bins, there yeah. now it's just one bin. Um, and you know what? Just totally like I haven't really ran into like now. I suppose if I was actually using this on a server and I had scripts, that would probably become an issue. But uh, I think they might even have symbolic links. Just using his regular desktop and using the apps, you would never even know. It really, it really makes you, it really makes you think about how the file system can be completely abstracted from the user, from the most point. Yeah. You just live in your home folder. You just live in your home and folder. That's about it. Everything yeah. else doesn't really matter all that much. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know that that was necessarily something all that important to spend time on for this release. Like, I mean, but it didn't really, it doesn't really hurt anything. I, at least not that I've noticed yet. My, my general idea when they announced that it was like, like, we're like, well, really, uh, it's just going to get buggy. And I haven't seen any problems yet. My guess is there's probably some applications out there that that's causes some little bit of haywire with, but so far, well, so good. Yeah. Um, no Chrome. What do you mean, no Chrome? No Chrome in the repo. Like, from what I searched, I searched for, I couldn't find Chromium, I couldn't find Chrome. Yeah. Nothing. I just, I mean, I, I just, there's just certain things that I, that a modern desktop repo, I know maybe it doesn't matter for you, but yeah, I was wondering if that would work. Uh, so uh, maybe, maybe it doesn't matter for you, but to me, it's really odd not to have Chromium in there. It's probably a licensing thing or something. No, like it's that. probably a licensing thing, but I don't, to me, it really doesn't matter. To me, like, for, for a while there, Chromium was fast and lightweight. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, Chromium takes more memory than Firefox. Oh, yeah, I know. Chrome, Chromium is now, it went from the fast, speedy little underdog to now it's more bloated yeah. than any other browser on the it, market. Though. I like, I use it for like uh, certain certain plugins. Same with like the reason why I use Firefox now. It's yeah, like I'm in the same you, boat. You got, you got the plugins. See, yeah. I don't ever use any plugins. I don't ever use anything. I just use a web browser to browse the web and then I close it. Yeah. Um, but I'm not really a live in the web kind of guy. Yeah. So I look at it as there's a, there's a, ton of of lightweight browsers in there yeah. um you know epiphany and midori and everything a, else i think it's a little i think it's a little interesting because go. there's i don't know to me it just seems seems like on a on, a, on an open source desktop there chromium's open source i would just love to see that included yeah yeah no it, it probably it, there probably is a repo there, somewhere yeah. oh totally I, but totally. i don't know yeah I, I never even bothered trying to, to find it well, uh, B Man, one of the things that I do have uh, kind words to say is the uh, Fedora 17 installation still uses that Anaconda installer that I like. I've liked for a long time. Their partitioner by default will use LVM, and it's a pretty logical, very simple LVM setup. Uh, Worked nice. My first installation failed. Really? But, yeah, but you know what? I came, went back, didn't use LVM because I just needed a simple setup, anyways. Installed just fine. Okay. One of the other things I like that's kind of neat is during installation, you can pick right there at one, one of the last screens, as you can say, Go ahead and install from software sources and from the update repos directly, and just skip the CD. Yeah, media. skip the CD. Basically, so you just basically are using the CD as yeah. just the live which boot probably installer. Means, which probably means they have a little net boot edition that's probably just the Anaconda thing with no packages on a little, you know, great for a USB stick or be great or installing, you know, five months or down those, the road or those little business card CDs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you know that I like those kinds of things because there are always are a ton of updates to get released, and always the other distros do this. Uh, and to different degrees, but I I thought the the thing I liked about Fedora was just right out of the gate you could say don't even don't even use the CD for installing just pull everything from the internet and Isn't it's just nice? and the, or just just go yank it or off. just get updates and then install from the CD and there's like three different options there that give you uh, I think it's great different choices yeah yeah all right well I, I installed from the local media just because I was paranoid but <laughs> but that yeah, worked yeah, fine yeah I did too yeah exactly I did too. Uh, because I didn't know if I didn't know, you know, beta, during the during the this point right now where it's going gold and everybody's probably how, how much is the repo getting the hammered? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all right. Well, any other thoughts on Fedora? Yeah, actually, a whole mess of thoughts on Fedora. So, 
so here's one of the things it really comes down to. Reviewing right. Fedora is typically kind of hard. Yeah. Because in the past, it's always felt like Fedora has had a bit of an identity crisis. What is Fedora for? Is it the power users distro? Well, if it's the power users distro, why is it not really cutting edge? Why why are other distros out there like Arch able to get the more up-to-date cutting edge packages faster than Fedora? So it's really not the cutting edge distro. So you can't really review it like that without poo-pooing on it. Right, I agree. Is it the end user distro? No, not really because it includes stuff that's a little too cutting edge. Yeah, and it doesn't do it doesn't really hold your hand as well as the other like, you know, I just right. tried I just went over tried to play a video. I just I just had a, a, you know a wall whereas other distros might actually go out and get the plug in for yeah, you. Yeah, they'll make it nice like and simple. Yeah. So you so it's so you're going to poo-poo on Fedora if you review it as is this is the end user normal person distro. Yeah. So then where does that where does that leave you exactly? Well, oh, it's the distro for if you happen to be administering a Red Hat server and you want a desktop that uses similar packages. I can packages. see that, but Fedora is now branching, you know, in at least in some regards, like before, when I had when I had a bunch of Red Hat servers I was managing, we had a Fedora box that was essentially that version of Red Hat Enterprise. So then you could script mm -hmm. on it and stuff, and, and try stuff out, and then move those scripts over to the Enterprise box. And it would, you know, generally you wouldn't really have to change anything at all. That's no longer the case by, by a pretty decent margin. So I don't know. I guess it, it does still fit that criteria, but not as yeah, well. Somewhat. Anymore. Yeah. But here's here's one thing I finally came to. And I think this is the first time that Fedora's ever really put themselves out there in a way where this this message starts to make sense. Okay. Fedora is that guy. When you go to a concert and he's wearing hippie clothes and he's dancing like crazy. He's the hippie dancing guy where he's just Does going he hat? nuts. Just cause, he probably has a cool hat. And he's dancing around and having a blast. And he doesn't care what you think of his hippie dancing. Fedora is the guy in the parade that's got the drums that is playing an entirely different rhythm than everybody else in the band. And it's the like rest Lisa of the Simpson. Band, you know, yeah. yeah. She, she's walking along with her saxophone yeah, and yeah. pissing off the rest of the band. Yeah. But you know what? She's going to do it her way. Everyone else hey, be damned. Know, I generally like Lisa Simpson. She seems like a good kid. You like Lisa Simpson. The world would be a worse place without those crazy hippie dancing guys at concerts. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about someone who really marches to their own particular rhythm. And I think that was really well expressed this year when they came along with their code name of Beefy Miracle. They basically said, you know what? Canonical's so silly with their alliterative right. animal names. We're going to come up with something that's also silly, and we're going to out-silly them to such a ridiculous degree that everyone in the world will talk about us being our own thing. See, so they came out with the beefy miracle with a giant damned smiling hot dog yeah, walking around. Yeah. And everyone in the tech serve, you go over to CNET, you go everywhere, they're talking about the beefy miracle. Well, that's kind of and a clever... It, I mean, it, it is... grabbed a lot of attention. It grabbed uh, a lot of people focusing on it. It made people realize that Fedora can't be reviewed like anything else. Fedora is its own particular thing. And and this is what kind of where I stopped to try and figure this out for myself. Does this mean that I am going to use Fedora 17 on all my desktop machines? Probably not. But I think that's that's because it's not for me. It's not meant for a guy like me. Me, I tend to veer more towards the way that both Canonical and the Novell folks do it. I like both of those distros. Mm -hmm. I tend to like those distros mm -hmm. a lot. Or so Arch. This isn't, I love Arch. Oh, God, I love Arch. But So this isn't going to win me over. But I realize that this distro, Fedora 17, is quality. It's one of the best releases I've seen of any distro. And it really accomplishes their goal of being their own thing. Mm. When you when you started talking about the release notes for it, the first thing you led with was a new edition of Haskell. What other distro in the world is going to put a giant smiling hot dog on the front and ship the latest and greatest Haskell? And make that one of their yeah. big points about the new distro. So, I've so always that's thought, what we got with Fedora, and it's kind of interesting. I think you might be on something, because the, I think the, the, the interpretation that I've always taken, going back to your drummer analogy, is that Fedora isn't playing their own tune they're just not playing the right tune because they're not a very good, <laughs> you know. Yeah, I hear they're you. not a very good player. And so then I thought, and I thought maybe that's not the case because you're right. They do do some very incredible, they do some amazing things. work. Yeah, like uh, Network Manager is. I mean, got, it came from there. 
Network Manager came from there, and in this release of Fedora 17, one of the new features in Network Manager is bonding NICs just yeah. right there in Network it's Manager. Just right, it's easy. That's awesome. It's so awesome. Uh, so, so then I, so I don't think it's necessarily that, but I, what I do wonder is if it, are they really truly independent? I mean, there's always that there's always that cloud that Red Hat sits above them, and and they are supposed to be eventually fed. Is that that Fedora distribution is eventually supposed to be sacrificed to the enterprise distribution? Got sure. It. And it's supposed to go up there and be ele- elevated and become this right. all-encompassing, stable distribution. And uh, I-, I always think that is their primary end goal. So That's I, what they're funded to do. I, I, so I don't know if they're just truly radical independence or not. I mean, maybe they are. I mean, it's definitely not a distribution for me. And I don't really think I would ever recommend it to anybody. In fact, I think if somebody said I'm new to Linux and I'm going to try out Fedora, I would say, I very much recommend you do not use Fedora for a new user. But if you came yeah. to me and you said, you know, like if it was somebody that had your your eye experience, I've used level, Linux a few times. Or, I'm good or, with it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, sure. Even that. Okay. If you use, use, yeah. Okay. Maybe then Fedora. Somebody like you and I, though, where you're really comfortable, you'll get in there. You can. You don't mind adding new repos, and you don't mind doing all those kinds of extra little tweaks. Yeah. I would totally recommend it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um. But but I would say it. It would have to be somebody who I would consider to be a more than a novice user by a pretty good degree. That's all. No, yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And, and even more than that, I think it has to be a particular type of person. You have to have a certain personality to want to run Fedora. Yeah. I mean, that's just how it is. If you have a neck beard, it's going to go easier. Yeah. And I'm not saying that's the only kind of personality that's going to really enjoy using Fedora, but it is going to help. I mean, if you look at, I mean, just look at these, this artwork. I mean, this is the, the beefymiracle.org history. They put together it's, a, it's, it's adorable. a theoretical, um, you know, kind of fictional background of where this hot dog came from. Well, since they don't really have to theme Gnome Shell, they got, they got extra time. <laughs> they didn't need to. It looks great. I don't disagree with you there. I it don't looks disagree great. With you there. Why screw it up? No, Why I don't screw it up? It I, think, I think this is one of the first times that Fedora came, came out in a long time and said, okay, let's just do what we yeah, need I, I, to do. I, I am a subscriber that sometimes to make something really good, you, you know, it's, it's also what, what you don't put into it. And sometimes that is, you know, you don't tweak something too much. You don't try to gloss it up too much. Uh, so I agree with you. Do it, do it right. And, and honestly, Fedora has made a, a big deal in the past, at least people from the Fedora project, about always giving back to the upstream packages. Work on the ux, upstream yeah. and then pick the ones you want for yeah. your distro. Yeah. And that's really what Fedora 17 did here. All these packages, all these things are all upstream. I mean, they're, they're all stuff that every other distro can get and use and love. All the themes, all the everything. And they just picked the ones that they wanted. And they had people work on those upstream packages that they needed to have updated in their distro. In a lot of ways, this is the quintessential way it should be done uh, in the grand yeah. Linux ecosystem. And they did an amazing job of it's, it. I, it's the most sustainable like for everyone. Yeah, it's yeah. the most sustainable for everyone. And what I love about that is not so much necessarily that I think they need to do that. But they think they need to do that. So this is a group of people who said that this is important. This is how it's going to be done. And then they actually executed on that, did it, and they followed through with it. It's not just people going around saying, I love free software, but not really doing it And I'm of the opinion, I think the end result is it doesn't make for a great distribution for users, but it does make for a great Linux ecosystem and open source ecosystem. Yeah, and that's and I I agree with you up to the doesn't make a great distro for users. I think this makes a great distro for users because I think I think that Fedora makes just a fine underpinning for the the under the guts of it all. And I think the GNOME Shell stock that they've got in here with what few tweaks there are makes a really nice desktop experience. Maybe I think you're being a little too generous. Do you think I'm being too generous? Yeah, but I, I, I'll say. I mean, it's 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 a fine desktop. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. See, I look at this and I say this is much more the way to go than say cinnamon and and what I don't Linux necessarily disagree doing. with you there because uh, you know I, I I'm rocking like this. You know, the GNOME extensions really are what make GNOME Shell great for me. Yes, because like going back to a more traditional menu is fantastically easier to find stuff. This activities menu is not is not the right way to find, especially when you don't know exactly what you're looking for, which is not really the case for most of us. And I think that's part of the problem. Like people don't realize that. But if, if you don't know what some of these things are... You're not going to find them. This is ridiculous. They're not organized properly. I mean, they, you can organize them, but it's not... Yeah, it, yeah. Gnome Shell, the activities view here, has the same problem that Unity does in 
-hmm. in terms of discoverability yep. of yep. things. Um, so I, I totally agree. Uh, they but expect you to search for everything, but if you don't know what to search for. That's the thing with Gnome Shell. It's so extensible. And you know what? It, am I going to, again, recommend Fedora 17 to someone who's never heard of Linux before? No. No, I'm absolutely not. But if you've gotten comfortable with Linux and then yeah. you realize what it is you want, and if this is what you want, you're going to go and use this. And this is quality. It's not like they come up with a release that's poo-poo. They came out with a good release. Mm -hmm. It's really quality. It's stable. It's fast. It works really well. I mean, heck, this is the first release, I think, in three releases that I've been able to install it properly. Nice. It's well, taken, so I mean, I mean, really, I mean, there's been so many problems in the past, but here I didn't hit any issues. So I installed it on, on raw yeah. hardware. I installed it under a virtual machine and right. both worked perfect and were fast. Now, will Fedora 18 live up to the same? We'll have to wait and find out. God, I hope so. All right. Man, I hope so. Well, there you have it, B-Man. And oh, yeah. before anyone says anything, Red Hat did not pay me anything to do this review. Now, why would people think that? And this is not, this is not, in the past I've made jokes about, is this Fedora Hate Week or Fedora Love Week? Like it was an alternating week schedule in the past. That's and that true. was kind of that. a bit of a joke, but also a little bit true. Uh, but no, this is not, I have no idea what week this should be. I, I, I've i lost track about a year ago. I don't know if this is Fedora Hate or Love well, Week. Well, I think you just banked about 100 negative weeks, so. So I'm all right. You're good. So I can be negative all the rest of the year, right? Yeah, I think so. No, but seriously, this is this is a great release, and and I, I think this is fantastic. Uh, I am not. I mean, take that with a grain of salt. I am not switching my distro. The chat room thinks you're just a little under the fantastic. weather. Fantastic. That's what they think. A little under the weather. Yeah. 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 I have some sort of a brain. See what fever. happens. We do this show two hours early, and then you get all positive. <laughs> it's great. All right, B-Man. Well, that's the Linux action. I've been show's waiting fun. all week to talk to you or someone else about this, but I'm like, I gotta save this. For this I, show. Yeah, you, I gotta man, save this. No one's, it. no one's gonna, no one's gonna believe me. I'm gonna like, I was like, I should do a blog post about this. I'm like, nope, nope. I'm gonna make people wait for the show for the first positive Fedora review Brian has done <laughs> in almost six years. Wow, wow. There you have it. That is the Linux action show's look at Fedora 17. Thanks, guys. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about partitioning your Ubuntu setup, and let's go ahead and pop on over to that. Now, you're noticing that I'm kind of running an Ubuntu within an Ubuntu situation, and the reason for that is simple. I want to run an environment to where I can play with the partitions and uh, play back and forth, and so and something that you can actually witness yourselves without me just talking about it, actually see what's going on. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I've done is we've booted from a live disk and we're going to try Ubuntu because we're going to be make, making some changes to the partition layout before we do anything real fancy. So let's go ahead and click that. And I will show you why I'm taking this approach here in just a moment. Wait for this sucker to go. Do, do, do. All right. Now, normally you would actually just go and do a full installation only if you were actually wanting to uh, get into a situation where you want to do a standard installation. But we're going to be doing some special partitioning, so bear with me while we do that. So let's jump back to the screenshot. Let's do a G parted. Bring my keyboard over to me. Whoops. There we go. Okay. Do, do, do. Click on G parted. Now, by bringing G parted up, we're going to actually be bringing up our little uh, partition manager. So let's pull that up here for you. All right, there we go. So as you can see here, I have unlocated space. And I'm going to basically be setting this up so that you are going to be running with a dedicated home partition as well as a decent swap file. And I'll explain why I'm setting everything up the way I am here shortly. But the biggest piece of it is that there's a lot of partitioning options you can get into. But we're assuming that you're running with two hard drives just for the sake of argument. And we're assuming that you're going to run home directory on a standard, I don't know, just a cheapo hard drive, but you're going to run uh, maybe your system files on a nice uh, solid state hard drive because you want something that's real fast and responsive. And that's certainly understandable. So let's jump back into that. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on unallocated space. I'm going to click new. All right. And let's go ahead and do that. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select this as my, do, 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 do. I'm going to do, I think we're going to go ahead and do the extended partition. And the reason for that is because you can only do up to four uh, primary partitions on your, on your system, you know, because there's certain limitations to that. But with extended partitions, you know, the sky's the limit. So we're going to go ahead and use that for our first partition. So it's good. Pop back into that and we will say, all right. 
I'm going to say free space. That's fine. That looks good. I'm going to do this at, normally I would do this at double RAM, but I'm going to go ahead and do this at 2,000 megabytes. And I'm going to do this as, not that this is going to actually stick, but this is just for my own memory. I'm going to do this up as swap, as an extended partition. That looks good. Click add. And that is all set up. Okay, that's fine. The next step is we're going to then click on... Oh, actually, I've actually got that set up the way I wanted. Good. So we will then pop back over to a located space. We will then right-click again, click New. Uh, again, now you have primary and extended partitions. In this particular case, I want my uh, partition setup for system to be a primary partition. And the reason for that is more from a tree hierarchy point of view more than anything. So I'm going to go ahead and set it up that way. So we will go ahead and make sure that is sent to ext4. We will set that label up as a main system here. Like so. And that's looking good. Free space. Blah, blah, blah. I'm going to use all the remaining space. That's fine. I'm going to click add on that. Okay. Two pending operations. Now we are pretty much where I want to be on that particular hard drive. You notice I have this pull down up here. The next hard drive that I'm going to be working with is actually the uh, home partition or what will be the home partition. And I'm going to remember, I'm keeping them on separate drives. So, and if I'm losing you here, because this is going a little quickly, don't fret. The actual show notes have the exact numbered step-by-step -step steps to take in order to get all this set up. So if I'm losing you at any point, don't worry about it. It'll all be taken care of. So not a problem. So we're going to jump back over to the miniature uh, partition or rather hard drive that we're going to be using for our new home partition and as you can see here it has already been set up with a file system but i'm going to go ahead and just double check that i'm going to actually just for giggles i'm going to delete that and then i'm going to recreate it so i'm going to pretend like this is what you would see it as i'm going to right click new and i'm going to say we're going to use the whole thing for home so that's fine i'm going to select the file system i want which for me is going to be ext4 i'm going to do uh what is called home Again, I don't expect these labels to stick, but they are helpful for the meantime. And everything looks good. Primary partition. I'm going to go ahead and do this and extend it as well. No sense in uh, taking away my uh, four available. Everything looks good there. I've got all new size. That's the max. That's fine. Great. Going to click add. And at this point, I'm going to just double check my work and make sure that all the work that I selected reflects what I want it to be. So as I come back into this, I'm going to go back to the system hard drive, and I see that I have system swap. That looks nice. Pop back over to my home. That's using the whole thing as I want it to. Great. I'm going to click this green check mark, and it's going to apply all these settings. And before I do that, I'm going to double check one more time, make sure everything is set properly. Looks good. Do, do, do. Yeah, I think we're good to go. So let us go ahead and click that. One thing you're going to note when you uh, click the green check mark, it's going to send you up a big nasty warning saying, are you sure you want to do this operation? If you're dual booting with Windows or something like that, you really want to make sure you're aware of the partitioning setup you have. And you may even want to go so far as to set up a uh, separate boot partition or other things like that, or maybe even a separate uh, temp partition. But that's really, for most home users running a dedicated Ubuntu box, it's really not necessary. My personal experience, other people may vary and I'll certainly uh, not argue that fact. But for me, I think it works fine. So. We're going to go ahead and click apply and say, yes, I am completely ready to hose these partitions. They're brand spanking new. I have no data that I want to save. I'm going to destroy it. Harsh words, but it's true. All right. That was quick. And thank you to System76 for this PC, which makes this operation, especially in a virtual machine like this, so snappy. It's just really helpful. So looks like everything took. Looking at my hard drive for home. Extended. Da, 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 da. Good, good. You'll notice the labels didn't really stick, but that's not surprising. It was more for my benefit. Okay, that looks good. So we're going to close Gparted. And now we're going to actually begin the installation process for Ubuntu. So let's jump back into the screen here. Because we're looking at the desktop, we're just going to basically click the uh, install Ubuntu option. And also bear in mind, this is not running on the uh, alternative CD. This is just running on the basic standard Ubuntu release because, frankly, for newer users, that is easier to use. A little more click and point. So let's go ahead and hit continue on that. Uh, I have mixed feelings when it comes to installing Ubuntu and downloading your updates. Um, it's handy, but sometimes it can be very time-consuming, so be wary of that. And, of course, with your third-party software, if you're a new newer user, I would recommend it because... 
quite frankly, if you're going to be wanting to play MP3s and such when you've completed your installation, that's going to save you a lot of hassle if you're not familiar with the extend, uh, installing your restricted extra, extras and all that sort of stuff. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and skip these for our benefit, but we will go ahead and hit continue from here. And because, now here's the key factor, because we've gone ahead and done our partitioning, we need to be very careful what we select here. Joe User is going to click Erase Disk and install, install Ubuntu if they're running a dedicated Ubuntu install. That's pretty much the standard thing that they're going to do. That's kind of their, that's kind of their, jam, their jam, if you will. For us, we did some unusual things. So we're going to click on something else. We're going to take a step on the wild side and basically review our work that we had done earlier. And while it is fair to say you could do this during the installation setup, I frankly, I find it a little more visually... Uh, easier to follow if you use Gparted than trying to use the installer itself because it can get a little sticky. Um, it, it, it gets, <laughs> gets a little interesting, although you will still have to use it to some extent. Now, you'll notice almost immediately while you have your file systems, you also have everything labeled as free space, which you know is, is kind of confusing to the new user. But if you look at your, your partition sizes, you can kind of spot where everything is. Uh, here, for instance, we see this uh, 2098. That's going to represent our RAM. And as a general rule, minimum swap space for a partition is going to be matching the RAM in your computer. Ideally, in a perfect world, I would even say double the size of your RAM. And that's simply because it's going to provide a more fluid uh, suspend and resume experience. Um, a lot of people that are having problems with resume and suspend, or a lot of times they don't have RAM set up properly, or not RAM, rather, their swaps uh, partitions set properly. So that's something to consider. So we can recognize that as proper. That looks good. Our next one is going to be our system partition, which we have obviously some interesting number choices there, but because we're working with virtual, it's okay. Um, I recognize that as my system. And notice that they're right next to each other. And also notice that I had the way I have you set up, you're going to have swap ahead of everything else. A little extra speed boost there. The second hard drive going into SDB has the free space located here. And we have 5368 megabytes, which obviously is extremely small, but again, these are virtual hard drives. So that's what we want. Now, we need to assign what's going to be used for which and so on and so forth. So the very first thing for swap is I'm going to come in and click add. I'm going to say, okay, it's already selected me as logical, which I had done previously. That looks great. Location is set to beginning. Awesome. Uh, use as ext4, even more awesome. Let's go ahead and pull that down to, why am I not getting the option? Oh, well, let's see if I can type it in because it's not pulling down for me. We'll do this. See if that will work or not. Yep, that seemed to work because for some reason that wasn't wanting to cooperate when I wanted my swap pull down. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, yeah. Yep, so that worked. It took. Okay, good. All right, the next one's going to be system. Same thing. We're going to do change, and that looks good. Now, it's already set to uh, use as, do not use. Obviously, we need to use this as our uh, file system. Well, there's swap area. That's awesome. Okay, so let's go ahead and select ext4. We are going to format this partition, and we're going to revisit our swap and find out why that's not playing ball for us. Go ahead and click OK on that. And we're going to pop back into here and find out what in the heck is going on. Delete that. Add. There we go. Helps when you do it right, Matt. There we go. Okay, so coming back to your swap, obviously I had things set wrong. Never hurts to double check your work. Use as swap area. That looks good at the beginning. Set to logical. Click OK. So thus far, let's click OK on that. Thus far, basically we have our swap at the beginning. We have ext4 at the... Uh, right after that. And as you can see by our mount points, swap does not actually have a mount point necessarily, at least visible to us. And then of course, our file system is gonna just be backslash. So pretty simple stuff there. Moving into our home directory, and it's gonna be on our separate hard drive. You'll notice the separate hard drive designations here. We are going to click add. You'll note that it's set to primary. The partition size has already been pre-set up for you, and it's going to set up at the beginning with the ext4. That looks great. Now, here's a critical point. When I do this pull-down menu, I'm selecting the home directory, and this is really, really, really key because this is going to be what 
distinguishes this setup from a standard installation, not only because you've set up your own custom swap, swap area, but also because your home directory is set up exactly in such a way to where if you want to reinstall later, you can maintain that home directory in the future. And I'll actually show you how to do that. It's actually kind of cool. So let's pop back over and we will click home. And I will say, yep, yeah, that looks good. I'm going to click OK. Now, before I hit anything, I'm going to review my work and make sure I didn't screw up like I did earlier with my swap area. Swap area looks proper. The size is correct and location is right. It is on the hard drive I wish it to be, SDA. Good, good, good. I'm going to pull that down a little bit and look at my home. Now, home is the XT4. Set it home. Proper size, proper location. Now, one other thing with home directory that you're going to do this time that you will not do in the future is you'll notice that it is currently set to format. And let's actually glance at that real quick. This is very important. Initially, yes, it needs a file system. It needs to be formatted. You need to actually tell it what it's working with because there's no data on it yet. In the future, you will not, in fact, do that. In the future, if you were doing an installation, you would make sure that this was not checked and you would have the option of unchecking it if there was data on that partition. So that's something to realize is that unchecking that format option is very important, as is reviewing your work. All right, so we are now ready to do installation, but there's one more step. You'll notice I did not do a boot partition. I, I can, I'm sure there's probably people screaming, why are you not doing a boot partition? Honestly, unless you're doing multiple operating systems or you're working with a more complex setup, it's really not that necessary. So I know some people will argue this, but based on my experience, for a single Ubuntu installation, it's really, you know, it's really not that big of an issue. Now, if you want to, you can do a 50 megabyte boot partition if it makes you feel better, and you can place that on whichever drive you would like. However, in our case, we're going to simply say, you know what, I'm going to drop this on right there on the uh, hard drive that's running my system. And that works for me because it makes me happy. All right, everything looks good. I'm going to click install, and it is going to go through the installation process. And this should be, uh, reasonably quick. Um, All right. Looks like we are ready to reboot. Yay. Okay. Let's hit restart. Thank you for your patience on uh, me waiting for that to install because this is totally worth it, in my opinion, because it really illustrates what we've been trying to do here. Uh, while that's rebooting, I'll go ahead and let that go. But because I want to really take a moment to show you why, just to help visualize why that matters to someone that's never done this, they hear me talking about a dedicated home partition and it really doesn't mean anything to them. Uh, they really, they don't understand. For new users, basically the, the core benefit is that if you completely destroy the system files on accident, not, not through something malicious, but rather because you deleted something or you uh, updated something that broke a series of files or whatever it may be, it's nice to have that option of uh, recovery and to be able to do so without losing all those core settings. So let's say you have a uh, Firefox installed, all your core settings are going to be in your home directory. So you have all your browser settings, um, any other software you're using, OpenShot, Audacity, whatever it may be, all your project files, all your documents, all your pictures, they're safe. So to me, that's a very important thing. And we are going to now log in and I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. Do, 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 do. All right. Booting up Ubuntu into Ubuntu. And you'll notice that it booted up very nicely and smoothly. Now, here's where the rubber meets the road. I'm going to open the home folder. And I am going to view our status bar so that you can see. Remember our sizing, the, the uh, size partitions we use. This is the free space for the home partition. Okay. Now, here's where it gets interesting. I click File System. Oh, no, that's a whole other animal. That's a larger amount of space because I used dedicated partitions for each. Even better, should my system hard drive fail, my dedicated home partition is rock solid safe. Bundle this with a proper backup scheme, which we will definitely be discussing in uh, future how-tos uh, using Bacula and other types of software. You're in, you're in a good place. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, hosing your stuff. So that's really all there is to it. I realize this is really long and really drug out, but there's a lot going on that for newer users, they need to get all the intricate details. And frankly, I wanted to set it up to where you know uh, what's happening. So thanks for uh, kind of bearing with me there. And now we're going to shoot it back to you guys. Thanks, guys. Hey, Chris. Yo. Who was that? Oh, that was Matt.
Matt was here. Fantastic. And that was a highly requested uh, how-to segment on how to do the uh, home partition. Wonderful. Line. That man. He's dreamy. <laughs> I want to say thanks to System76, too, for uh, sponsoring that how-to segment. And they sent Matt this Wild Dog Performance rig right here, which he keeps, and I believe he snuggles with at night, and mm -hmm. then he comes up with these how-tos, and then he stops by. That's and... perfect. That's perfect. And you know, I've been hearing rumors about how they were thinking about sending some more of these out to someone. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't know who. Maybe some pretty guy with a scarf and some glasses. Oh, I, I heard rumors. What about a guy with nice hair? Rumors. Nope. No guy with nice hair. They have. They don't like guys with nice hair. I think they're from Colorado or something like that. I don't think people uh, in Colorado have nice hair. So they feel is. a little weird about it. But they do like scarves. So they're like, scarf guy, here you go. Here's I a wild dog. I wear a scarf. Dude, it's too late. You're not scarf guy. Well, I'm scarf guy. So thanks to System76, even if they don't care about my hair. That's so true. Yeah, yeah. All right, Beamer, what you been working on? Oh, my Lord. What have I been working on? Oh, oh, oh. Switch the screenshot over here. I want to show you guys this. This is Linux Action Show, the game. Uh, so I uh, uh, I put out my Brian Lunduk's Awesome Blocks of Awesome, or Blaba, my little game-making tool. Yeah. And started a contest called Build Something Fun and Win Some Pie, which ends tomorrow. So it ends end of day Monday. So you have until end of day Monday to get a, your entry in if you want to you wanna try and win that Raspberry Pi or some games or something. But one of the entries... One of the entries, the guy took some time, made tiny little 8-bit versions of you and me. That's awesome. Where we run around in a maze. It's a two-player simultaneous game, and we try and collect the penguins. We try and collect tuxes. Is he going to release this? Yeah, well, I'm releasing it oh. on, uh, on Tuesday or something like that. So this is part of the contest. So he, this is his entry to the contest. And I just got to say, what an awesome way to suck up to the judge. To release a video game with yeah. him yeah. as a little little avatar in yeah. there. Yeah. I mean, he did a pretty good job on them too. I mean, they're little. They're kind of we kind of look like we have like Stewie Griffin heads. We're kind of smashed football heads. That's all right, it's okay. But you got to fit in the square. You got to fit in the square. And uh, so I love that. So there's a whole bunch of other ones out there too. If you want to get in on the contest, go to lunduke.com and scroll around in the blogs until you find it there. Uh, you'll also note over there uh, I made an announcement uh, this last week. What? And I just want to say this. Uh, if you don't want to buy my stuff, don't buy my stuff. But I've been thinking about it. Uh -huh. And I've been thinking for a few months now. I want to never have to boot into other OSs. Okay. So I rate co cross-platform software. And most of my work is done on Linux. But I always have to have Windows and Mac, especially Mac around, because you can't build Mac apps without a Mac. Or you can't build iPhone apps without a Mac. And so if I want to make my apps available for those platforms, i got to dual boot. Or i got to have that hardware. I hear you. So I've been working on a way to where I don't need to do that. Where I never need to leave Linux. So what I created was something I'm calling the Illumination Creation Service. Ooh. So the next version of Illumination Software Creator, version 5, comes out in like just shy of two weeks, I think. It's sometime, it's early June. I can't remember. The date's posted up on the website. And if you own the deluxe version, you can say, make your app, hit a button which sends your app up to the creation service, it will build your iPhone version, your iPad version, your Mac version, package it up as a dot app, package up a dot exe for Windows, send it back down to you, so then you can deploy and test. That's cool. Yeah, don't have to leave. You don't have to leave. So I mean, you don't. So you can build. Granted, you can, if you want to actually run the apps and test it out, you've got to copy right, it over to a machine. Right. But you don't have to leave. Wow. That's really that's, yeah. So I can just stay. That seems in like what Linux. if you get a bunch of that seems like there could be a lot of uh, jobs that could be submitted and crank away on your hardware. Oh, I, How do you do the Mac thing? How do you build the iOS thing? It's so great. It's so great, man. I tell you, I did good. You mad scientist? I did good. I'm mad scientist the hell out of this thing. Nice. So the the creation service is totally free. But if you go over to radicalbreeze.com uh, or lunduke.com, you can pick up the deluxe edition for Illumination Software Creator for fifty bucks, and that includes a free update to the next version, which has the creation service that's totally free. Huh? Damn. So you never have to leave Linux. You can literally drag and drop around and drag and drop around. Never write any code. Have an app for Android, iPhone, iPad, Mac. Uh, Windows, friggin' everything, auto built for you. It is ridiculous. That's the it future. Is ridiculous. That's the future. It makes me so happy. I even, if you go to lunduke.com, yeah. there's even a video, little little one minute, how to build an app in sixty seconds or less. Uh, a little like nice. commercially thing. Yeah, yeah. Did that. Good job. Video. Man. You know how I made that? Huh. Katie in live. Yeah, I saw you said something about I. You open shot with. Oh. 
I was having a hell of a time, open man. Shot was, yeah. I was trying to use open shot to edit my video together, and the damn thing crashed. I swear to God, every ten minutes or so, it was yeah. just driving me crazy. The third time it crashed, open shot totally hosed my video project file. Just hosed it. I had that. Yeah. Just beyond words. So I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna look go over to PTV because PTV has have had some good success with yeah. the past. Yeah. Oh my God! Same problems. Was crashing. Was corrupting files. Plus, PTV doesn't really have like title editors, nice ones. Oh. And so I had to go make like PNG files with and my titles, it. and oh, it was doing terrible. Then someone's like, "You should check out Katie and Live again." And I'm like, "You know, it's been a while." Loaded up Katie and Live. It was so dreamy. Nice. It, it worked. Fast, Got the job done, huh? Customizable. Never crashed once. So easy to use. I was just blown away at how quality Katie and Live is nowadays. Like it wow. amazed me. Wow. I was amazed. I just, anyway, I just had to say that as a shout out for Katie and Live. Way to go, They guys. did a great job. Well, that's cool. So uh, I'm going to pat myself on the back a little bit. I, I'm really happy with the way episode two of Unfiltered turned out. Uh, we're calling this one Security Theater Critics. And uh, I'll just say this. There was recently uh, three countries were involved in something that was an obvious attempt to scare people <laughs> about uh, transportation security. <laughs> and uh, I got the clips that, uh, that uh, sort of lines it all up and then we knock it home and show you how the, how they really pl use the media to play you play you and, and make you scared yeah. and all that kind of stuff so great episodes episode two of unfilter is out right now i started releasing it on saturdays because well, i get it and it's like oh it's like a really good one i want to get it out there and i'm like i can't wait till monday so <laughs> that's, that's a sign of being pretty excited You're adorable. I, I can't even wait till the release day <laughs> you are adorable i know so check it out so let's see okay too. so the first episode was about pot yep and the second episode was about how government's scaring you. Well, it's actually more about the TSA. Okay, how the TSA yeah. scared you. Yeah. I'm kind of sensing a theme. Maybe. I'm going to be honest. It's I'm more honest. like a critical theme. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give this... I'm going to give this to episode five, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you in a shoebox. I'm going to say, this is the kind of person you are. Hey, man, and I'm it's not going there. Jupiter Files on you here. I'm just saying. Whoa. I'm just saying. Whoa. Uh, no, what it is, <laughs> is uh, I really hate big media. Like I yeah. hate CNN. I think I think CNN and Fox News are responsible for some of the biggest. What about Anderson? Oh man, <laughs> don't get me started on Anderson Pooper, dude. He is. Whoa. Oh man, don't get me going Holy on him. Holy moly, dude. Oh. Holy oh, I'm moly. All fired up, B man. Man, you uh, are like the ball of anger today, and I'm just full of love and should, peaches. You should listen I'm to I'm the love and flowers guy. I I I, I the first twenty. Man, I'm gonna say this straight. All right. I am so glad we've switched. <laughs> you being the angry dude, I'll be Mr. Happy Pants. I feel just huh? it's just this weight no off way, of my Brian. shoulders. I'm so happy now. Uh, listen to the first 20 seconds of episode two of Unfilter, and then it, it's great. It's the first 20 seconds; they're awesome. Okay, but then stop. No, you'll keep. You'll want to keep going. You sure? Oh yeah. I, I could stop if you no. want me to stop. No, you'll want to keep. Going. Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, also, I think in the coming up in these later segments, this is by the way the new season. Maybe it's time to do something a little new. We won't do it all the time, but I'm going to try to get some emails in here, and we'll read. We haven't done that for a while. Ever. So, I've, so every few episodes. It's been, it's been a year or two. It, it's what, Seems like. Uh, it's, you know, uh, man, I know. It's one of those things where we got a packed show. It's hard to fit it in. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's hard to pick which one to do, but I'm going to break down, and I'm going to start doing it. So we'll try to get some email feedback in here. So, of course, you can always email us, linuxactionshow at jupiterbroadcasting.com. But honestly, probably a better chance of it showing up on our radar if you do something like on the Reddit on the subreddit over at linuxactionshow.reddit.com or on Twitter or like on Google Plus because those are a little easier because there's so much email that comes in that it's kind of hard to even even distinguish it all. Dude, tons of stuff. But seriously, I would love to get more yeah. feedback to them. We used to even have like a call in line or we yeah. could play questions and we everything. We still could. Like that. It's just it never, you know, it was like you have to it really... It was hit and miss. You have to really ask people to do it and I don't like to always ask people to go do things. I don't, like yeah, that. come on. Yeah. Just, just enjoy the show. I don't want to have to ask people to do things. Oh, oh, but if you go over to lunduke.com... What? <laughs> I never heard of it. And you click, there's a link in there for the store now. Uh, now, I, I held this bundle deal like last week. And people really liked it. And then I extended it because some people were like, oh, I missed it. So I extended it for a little while. And then I stopped it because it was a really good bundle deal. Um, but then people emailed me again. They're like, oh, Brian, I missed it. And I'm like, guys, I don't want to. I cannot stay in business if I keep making everything cheap. But here's what here's what I did. If you go to the store now, the store. I have little bundles that technically are cheaper, but not just not like a ton cheaper. Like you can get both Illumination and Blaba for like 15 bucks off if you buy both. You can get both my games for like three bucks. 
bucks off. If you buy everything, you get like 30 bucks off, but it's not like crazy, crazy cheap like it was. It's just cheaper. Right. It's just it's just pretty cheap. Now, now you can now you can afford a burger. Too. Now I can afford to go and buy an organic burger right. if I if I need to. I'm yeah. trying to eat organic right now, Chris. Oh, right. And it costs like a dollar more for everything. Every, well, yeah. Organic. Yeah, totally does. Seriously. You should have an unfiltered about that. I think I might. I think I because might. it is ridiculous. I agree. So if I want something with less ingredients, mm -hmm. it costs a dollar more. Mm -hmm. Friggin' ridiculous. It is a big problem. I've been tracking a few food-related stories. Like, I just saw the story come out that uh, a lot more homeless people are obese than you'd expect for people that are homeless and are, like, uh, scavenging. But because of the types of foods that they end up eating, yeah. they just pack on the pounds. It's crazy. Yeah. So it's, there's it's some crazy. interesting stories there. Yeah. All right. Crazy. Well, B-Man, shoot. Uh, I, think I don't think we got anything else to talk about. No, I, I think, think we're done. I think that's everything. But seriously. Number 17 is really good. Oh, uh, the chat room <laughs> really cha good. The chat room was poking me, uh, but I forgot, but I'll just mention it now, is uh, we have a mail sack segment in the faux show now, and people have been telling me wait, I should mention the faux wait, show on last, so I mention it now. A mail sack. So when we get questions that are like uh, general networking questions, actually, just any kind of questions, Angela grabs in. I'm going to be honest. Angela reaches into the mail she, sack. She grabs the mail sack. She grabs into the mail sack and pulls out. It's not... This is not appropriate for the next action. So we right. usually cover, in every faux show, towards the end, That's we usually cover start. one or two or three emails. We don't need a mail sack. No, no. no not in mail sack's show. in the faux show. Okay, that's yeah. not in this show? No, no. God. So what, I don't know what you guys are doing in the faux show thing. That's, <laughs> that's a little, that's a little twisted, man. Dude, we're reaching inside our mail sack and we're responding to people's emails. So sometimes right. if you send an email and you don't hear back, we're actually reading them in the faux show. All right, so uh, if you want mail sacks, you go to the faux show. If yeah. you want a show with no mail sack dangled at you, right. Linux Action Show. Right. There you go. And actually, that's there, the difference between the shows. There actually is some mail sack dangled in this in this last faux show. There was. Uh, did you see that? No. Okay. I know we got to go. I know we got to wrap. But this, I probably shouldn't put it in the show. This might not be safe for work. So maybe I won't. Maybe I won't. Here, I'll see if I can find. Don't it do real it. Quick. Don't 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 do it, man. I'll show don't it to do you, it. I'll don't show do it. it. Don't don't do it. What do you, what is? Oh, dude, that's not safe for work. <laughs> and look at oh, my reaction. Oh, dude, look at my reaction. Right? I mean, don't do that. Take that off that. Take it off that. <laughs> Inappropriate. Yeah. So Inappropriate. That, 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 happened, that happened during last week's photo show. For you audio Lordy listeners, uh, it turns out... Don't, don't even imagine it, audience. This is terrible. Audio listeners, it turns out there's a site called Awkward Boners. And, uh, <laughs> and, Chris, uh, come on. <laughs> we don't need this right now. Okay, all right. We don't need this. All right, everyone. Well, thanks so much for tuning to this week's episode uh, of the Linux Act. We totally have switch roles. This is hilarious. But be sure to tune in. We'll be live <laughs> next Sunday at our regular 10 a.m. time, right? Yeah. All right, so tune in live at jblive.tv at Sunday, 10 a.m. Pacific. Oh, Otherwise, Lord. download the show just a few hours later. Yeah. Just by any format you want. Anything over you want. Broadcasting. There you go. Links to everything no we talk sex. about in the show notes. <laughs> thanks, everyone, for tuning this week. See you right back here next week. Right after you buy stuff from London.com. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, uh, here we go. I, I got. Uh, I got to scratch. I got to adjust. Do what you gotta do. All right.